with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25%. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm here with a very special guest, uh, Dr. Laszlo Boros, who is joining us all the way from Hungary. Um, Dr. Boros, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us and taking the time out to speak with me. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's an honor. And uh, thank you for your time to do this interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for people who haven't come across your work, can you tell us a bit about yourself and, and what you do? So um, I'm a medical doctor. I finished um, my medical school in Hungary in 1987, shortly after I went to Germany and then to the U.S. to pursue a research in science and teaching um, the curriculum. I started at the um, Ohio State University in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio, where I stayed for eight years. And in 1998, I joined the faculty of UCLA, <clears throat> University of California, Los Angeles, Department of Pediatrics, where I was um, researching, teaching, and some clinical work in the form of clinical trials, serving the data analysis and uh, the uh, laboratory and analytical needs of those projects. And then I became a full professor of <clears throat> pediatrics in uh, 2017. And um, I retired UCLA in 2021, July. And I came to Europe to teach deuteronomics or deuterium chemistry uh, using medical and diagnostic as well as therapeutic applications. And um, I'm teaching now in Amsterdam, in Hungary, Budapest, uh, <clears throat> a little bit in various other places and colleges. And we do have collaboration with some other scientific areas, for example, cultural and, and religious text export their scientific uh, implications. So it's, it's more like a application of deuteronomics in many, many different fields, but practically, my training is in medicine and, and medical biochemistry. Very good. So, um, so you, your main focus now is, is deuterium research and teaching, uh, as I understand it. And uh, how did you come across this in the first place? What made you interested in um, you know, the field of deuterium and how it affects our health? Um, <clears throat> well, as, as you know, and, and I'm sure you covered this in other conversations as well, deuterium is a rare yet very different isotope from hydrogens or protons, which actually move and kind of keep our body in a energy producing yet, you know, flexible and durable kind of uh, characteristics. So these two isotopes, protons and deuterons or hydrogen or deuterium, <clears throat> they have a major influence in many, many biological processes. And I was not um, pursuing actively research in this area until I met Dr. Gabor Shomiri, who wanted to clarify uh, some of his research um, uh, questions. And we did a project back in 2003, 2004, which we <clears throat> published, I was here at uh, UCLA at that time which we published in 2005 and 2006. And then <clears throat> it was uh, practically a finished completed project with very interesting results, but we never really explored the biochemical uh, details or biochemical implications of those studies uh, to the thorough or, or the deepest extent. We did discuss the data obviously, but was not 
get um, uh, fundamental as far as explaining mitochondrial functions until 2009, when I got a phone call from the National Cancer Institute uh, from Dr. Marston Lidahan, who uh, encountered, they had a relatively young patient who had kidney cancer and uh, only genetic or metabolic deficiency they could detect was a fum fumarate hydratase um, enzyme deficiency. And that's where I actually realized that the water recycling system in mitochondria is a deuterium depleting or de de it's part of the deuterium depletion process or depletion process in our body. And uh, the mitochondrial matrix produces deuterium depleted water from food. And uh, if this defect is permanent, meaning that if this defect exists in patients, then they may develop cancers that are very rapid and biologically they behave in a very aggressive manner. So then we started kind of unfolding this mitochondrial matrix, deuterium depletion scenarios and uh, various proton transfer processes through nanomotors and proton pumps. And uh, that's where the, the effect of deuterium became uh, biochemically or medically very important simply because it can destroy these very delicate uh, machines in our in our body in our system and we published a paper with Gabor um, actually talking about these mechanisms these enzyme reactions and the importance of deuterium depleted water and then um, other people other investigators found the topic very interesting. So they started their own studies, their own investigations, and they found out that actually the tomb is a very important isotope, both from how to deplete it or how to accumulate it in certain body parts. And now we are establishing, or I have established a field, which called deuteronomics that studies um, nothing else, but practically the effect of the tomb in relation with protons or hydrogen in our body and in biology in general. And so we are now <clears throat> using these grown and grown body of studies and evidence that how deuterium has to uh, be maintained, let's put it this way, in our body to preserve health. And uh, <clears throat> now we teach this at the Rye University, University at Rye uh, in Amsterdam, which is a four credit uh, college course now. So I'm, I'm pretty much interested in biochemistry in general, the function of these very delicate proteins and the two has a very significant effect there. And this is how I ended up pursuing deuteronomics to the full extent, meaning that we do uh, perform studies, we do editorial work, reviewers are instructed by me if I'm the editor of papers, how to approach their clinical or scientific problems from the deuteronomics perspective. So it's, it's quite a, a new field, yet it's grown and it's getting more and more influential. Yeah, very good. Well, it's great that it is growing. I mean, even, even the fact that this has been on the radar, uh, you know, mainstream radar since, you know, early two thousands is, is, uh, quite good. I mean, it's, it's something that I haven't really come across myself until I spoke with, um, you know, uh, some people that had, had spoken with you and, and, uh, Gabor as well. And, but it's something that's very interesting to me. I did my undergraduate degree in molecular uh, and cellular biology. And so it makes perfect sense. You know, when, when you started looking at it, it made, it made a lot of abundant sense to me that this would be very influential. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned cancer and, and we should definitely get into that, but do you, are there other disease processes in the body that, uh, that can be affected by yeah, an abundance or depletion of uh, deuterium. Yeah, so <clears throat> I I think now, and we believe now that all major disease processes, epidemiological diseases or scales, obesity, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, um, and you name it, the uh, deuterium plays a role. Um, now, or the deuterium level or the deuterium exposure of your 
body or your biochemical mechanisms that separate protons from deuterons, uh, they all play a role. So after all, when these biological systems are exceeded or exhausted because of the excess deuterium in our environment, then various disease, various symptoms may appear. And depending on what organ or organ system is hit the, the most, then you develop diseases according to those scenarios. So practically, uh, it's almost like an inevitable, very fundamental, critical part of medicine or biochemistry used in the form of, of medical approaches or, or therapeutic approaches. So we believe that this deuteronomic story is just in the very early or very um, I would say um, experimental stage with some far reaching clinical applications. But I, I think after all, all major disease processes uh, are affected uh, one way or another with deuterium by deuterium load in our body. I'm not sure if you know all the details yet, we are working on to uncover all these mechanisms and to have doctors at the bedside like yourself uh, with some deuteronomics knowledge and, and basic principles that you can use in your therapies. Very good. Um, I know that the, the deuterium, uh, and we would like to hear your thoughts on, on uh, and, and your knowledge on how it affects like the mitochondria uh, specifically, because there's a lot of people that are now saying that a lot of these diseases are metabolic diseases that are stemming from damage to the mitochondria. And I understand that the deuterium can play a role in, in damaging uh, the effects of the mitochondria. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So the mitochondria is where our water is produced, uh, metabolic water from food and oxygen. And there are these very delicate nanomotors that spin anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 rotations per minute. And they transfer protons from the mitochondrial inner membrane, or there's a inner membrane mitochondria that these nanomotors sit in, and they transfer uh, protons into the matrix where oxygen is waiting and water is produced. Now, the amount of water or the amount of protons that are transferred each day are, are, are really excessive, meaning that we are talking about, um, about uh, uh, 1,500 protons per second uh, by these delicate nanomotors. And when they are damaged, when these uh, delicate nanomotors are functionally or, or, or structurally damaged by the twice as heavy and twice as large, if you look at the nucleus of the deuteron, um, if they are damaged, these nanomotors, then somehow you encounter, well, that's, that compares to like a broken engine in your car. And for, from then on, all sort of problems will develop around, meaning that the TC cycle, we slow down, cells go into a metabolic state that we call the Warburg metabolism, when even in the presence of oxygen, they are unable to produce uh, carbon dioxide and, and water and ATP. And um, glycolysis becomes um, a more uh, prominent simply because the mitochondria is not able to consume up all the glycolytic products, meaning that lactic acid is produced in excessive amounts that we know about tumor cells, but it's also true of diabetes and obesity. And this molecular crowding process takes place, meaning that it's more like it's not only your engine is damaged, but also your exhaust system is damaged, meaning that you cannot really burn completely your fuels, your food, and it will deposit in your tissues, in your cells, in your liver, fatty liver develops, fat deposition starts. So after all, if you look at anabolic um, disease processes that actually gain how you gain body uh, mass or weight is practically related to these broken nanomotors and broken nanomotor uh, functions in mitochondria or broken mitochondria. And that means you cannot really uh, bring your system into a carbon balance, meaning that you can actually breathe out as much carbons as you consume in the form of carbon dioxide, because that's what mitochondria do. Can we call it biological combustion or complete substrate oxidation. Practically, the 
fate of food that we eat should be carbon dioxide, water, and energy, ATP. But we need uh, impact nanomotors for this. If those are broken because deuterium interferes with their actions, then rotating functions, then this metabolic crowding process takes place that is host, that will host a, a, a number of diseases. And those are now appearing on epidemiological scale all, all around. And that's practically the part of the fundamental mechanism that, that kind of underscores the importance of mitochondrial um, integrity and functions in any living system. So for that matter, mitochondrial nanomotors and proton transfer and TCA cycle or crap sender cycle functions are essential for our health. So it's not only diseases, but also how to maintain a, a, a healthy kind of lifestyle that definitely will have implications that come down to how much do you be consuming in food and water. Yeah. And so how, how does this build up in our system? Like, is, is it, is it um, certain things that, that we eat are worse for us in deuterium standpoint, or there's certain things that we can do that better and, and deplete this down or, or how do we, how do we manage that just on a daily basis? Yeah. So um, deuterium has a disposal system in our, in our body. It's, it's through water. But the water is produced in the cytoplasm instead of the mitochondria. The glycolysis itself, and that's the process we know the most. Actually, I was at UCLA, I gave a talk about the deuterium depleting function of glycolysis by exchanging deuterium that kind of tried to use glucose uh, and, and other carbohydrates as Trojan horses to kind of take deuterium down to the mitochondria. Glycolysis will exchange each and every carbon hosting hydrogens or potentially deuterium with uh, cytoplasmic waters, hydrogen. We call them proton exchange reactions. That's why glycolysis is so complicated or looks complicated. Actually, it's very simple because it's just a proton deuterium exchange set of reactions, but it has about 10 reactions and a glucose molecule would have 12 hydrogens. So they each have to be checked and have to be removed and exchanged with cellular water that has less likelihood of having deuterium in the cytoplasm, especially if it comes from uh, the mitochondrial matrix, that water, cellular water. So it's practically a glycolysis-based deuterium scavenging mechanism. Deuterium ends up in water and cytoplasmic water can leave to the interstitial, interstitial water, that circulation and kidney and urine can be the disposal um, mechanism, how you get rid of deuterium. And when these systems are exceeded or overloaded or exhausted, these uh, glycolysis, glycolysis related reactions, then mitochondria slowly is making it down to your um, deuterium is slowly making it down to your mitochondria and start damaging nanomotors. So, and when that happens, and it comes with age and depends on how much deuterium loaded food you have consumed in your life. So, practically in younger ages, deuterium gets deposited in connective tissues because we need deuterium certain amounts for collagen and bone strength and so on. So, our body, our biochemistry has this kind of um, kind of sorting out or separating or discriminating these two isotopes, these two hydrogen isotopes. One is because deuterium is, is important for hydroxyproline and proline um, amino acid bonds in collagen. So that provides your bone strength. And there's a very interesting study out from the Karolinska Institute by Dr. Roman Zubarev, who showed that actually gray seals, uh, cartilages or, or connective tissue uh, collagen, uh, and specifically two amino acids, proline and hydroxyproline, can have over twice or even almost three times of the deuterium that is in the environment. We don't know yet the, all the mechanisms that let deuterium to separate in our body and how it accumulates into connective tissues, and this is a phenotype related phenomenon. Um, 
but practically moving parts, and these are structural proteins. So as long as when, if you imagine like building a house for the walls, you need very solid blocks. For your exercise in the house, you need flexible devices. So, or, you know, faucets and, and so on. So um, wherever we are in the body and we talk about nanomotors and proton pumps and so on, you cannot fit deuterium in those systems. If we talk about connective tissues, especially in challenging environments, for example, in seals who have to dive 200 meters, 300 meters, and they are trying to escape from killer whales and white sharks while they are feeding, their life is not easy for that matter. So in their bones, in their connective tissues, they have to pile up some um, deuterium that is actually have stronger chemical bonds with the surroundings. So uh, for structural proteins, deuterium is required. For delicate uh, rotating proteins, deuterium has to be excluded. Those are proton-based operations. So when these systems that separate the two ions or two isotopes of, of protons are exhausted, overwhelmed, um, diminished or damaged, or there's just too much deuterium coming into the system, then deuterium starts making its way into these rotating, delicate, energy producing, and um, you know, various other functions you know, are related with these nanomotor functions, these proton pump functions. This is how we generate energy for that matter and, and metabolic water. So simply when this occurs, then, then you're not able to sort out these two isotopes very efficiently. So you start encountering some cellular damage and that's when disease start developing. First, you experience some like not optimal health situations or obesity in some ways or diabetes or some other um, neurodegenerative diseases or symptoms of those. And over time, they are becoming more and more prominent with, with prominent symptoms. And we believe that those are all related to the tumor in your environment, in your food, in your drinks, and the mechanisms that are actually separating these two isotopes. And that's why we have certain approaches to deplete the tumor so your body can sort it out. And uh, for that matter, this deuteronomics and the therapeutic arm of this uh, approach seems very critical to provide better medical care. This is what we, this is okay. what we are pursuing. Yeah, very good. And then, so how, how, what are the biological effects on, on the cells that, uh, with, with deuterium on the cell that can perpetuate or maybe even cause, but certainly further uh, proliferation of cells and, and cancer? So the DNA itself, um, which we know is a very critical part of the cell division process as a signal, as DNA grows in the cells um, and the nucleus of, of our cells would split, then the cell proliferation process is enhanced. Yet uh, tumor cells do this continuously. And uh, we do know that the hallmark of the most important sign or descriptor of tumor cells is anaploidy, meaning that there's more DNA there are more chromosomes, there are abnormalities, they are, they are changing shape and form and numbers, and uh, that's a continuous growth signal. Now, this can be, um, and this is induced by deuterium in uh, DNA bonds. Because how DNA is built is, is if DNA has a sugar backbone, uh, which is called deoxyribose. This is why it's called the deoxyribose based uh, nucle nucleic acid, that's DNA, and this de deoxyribose in specific carbon positions can acquire deuterium. And these deuterium bonds cannot be broken. They cannot be used by, they cannot be broken by DNA repair enzymes and so on. So it seems like in the presence of excess deuterium, your DNA start 
growing in your DNA uh, f um, uh, and your chromosomes start growing in numbers, meaning that you produce more DNA for that matter, you produce more chromosomes. And for that matter, you, you start a, a continuous um, uh, cell growth or division cycle, meaning that these cells will divide in an unlimited, unlimited fashion. And this is what cancer is. These are cells that we cannot stop them from proliferating. And this is because their DNA is modified, the chemical structure of their DNA is modified by deuterium. So if you encounter a deuterium in the third or the fifth carbon position of this sugar backbone of DNA, those bonds will be two and a half times harder to break. Meaning that your DNA is gonna be more sticky it cannot be split, it cannot be repaired, it cannot be cut out. It, it, there's a, a number of problems that, that you have to face after your DNA is accumulating, in, after the tumor is accumulating in your DNA. So we believe that the continuous cell growth signal in the presence of the tumor is because it modifies the nature and the behavior of DNA and the amount of DNA that we have in these cells. And the bottom line is to deplete deuterium in those cells, and that has been shown by Gabo Shomia and many other investigators, that is a very efficient way of uh, treating cancer, especially special, especially certain kinds of cancer. But it's, it's a DNA chemical mismatch between um, proton bonds in DNA, in the sugar moiety and the deuterium, um, chemical behavior in these molecules, and that's why DNA um, piles up in tumor cells and they have a unlimited division pattern from there. So practically it's a underlying biochemical mechanism to make, to grow the amount of DNA in your cells yeah. and became undifferentiated and cancerous, yes. Yeah, and, and I suppose like you mentioned Otto Warburg previously, you know, he, you know, obviously he was, um, you know, published, I think it's 1956, his paper discussing the origin of cancer. And he was, he was arguing that this had a lot to do with dysfunction in oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria as well. And it sounds like the deuterium could also affect that and damage the mitochondria, it's obviously damages the mitochondria, damages cellular function in that regard as well. Is that correct? Well, he did a very interesting experiment. I, I, I'm, have you read his original papers or his original work? Uh, a long time ago, but yeah. A long time ago, yeah. So um, what he did, he actually implanted tumors in the muscles of dogs. And one side was a gastrocnemius and one side was intact. The other one had a tumor. Host, and he was measuring lactic acid hmm. of the of the outflow blood <clears throat> of the muscles. And the muscles that had um, tumors, they did produce a lot more lactic acid than the normal muscle. And it was in the same host animal, meaning that the influx or the, the, the blood supply was the same to both uh, tissue. So he concluded that, and this, this is pretty much what he was saying, that he said, in tumor cells, the product of glucose metabolism is lactic acid. Mm -hmm. And this is what we, even in the presence of oxygen, meaning that the, the dogs were oxygenated, meaning that there was no difference in oxygen level between the muscles that he measured lactate in. So practically, he uh, first detected this metabolic or metabolite crowding that we, we, we covered in a minute. <laughs> meaning that um, he could show that, and we are talking about eight, 10 times more lactic acid. So it's not a marginal change. These are very robust changes when you look at tumor cells. He did not know that much about mitochondria back then in the late twenties or early twenties. And I think he got the Nobel prize sometimes in the early forties. Like, like 31 or something like that. Or 31 or yeah. early thirties. So at that time, they did not know much about proton transfer mitochondria, but then as we learned more about the system, the, 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 the lactic acid that he observed and he measured in those muscles 
um, that hosted tumor cells were coming from pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid is the substrate for mitochondrial complete substrate oxidation. So when pyruvic acid is not broken down into mitochondria, then it is expelled from the cells in the form of lactic acid. And this is what he observed. Mm. And it's a very, um, I would say, prom it's the most fundamental hallmark of cancer. I know there is not new genomic hallmarks of cancer, which really don't hold. I, I don't think this, um, this uh, new wave of genomics explain much about tumor cells, but this network scenarios, they are very critical, very important. Now, obviously, when pyruvate has to be disposed in the form of lactic acid, that means the mitochondria is not able to accept pyruvic acid to harvest protons and to produce metabolic water using these nanomotor functions. So those nanomotors are broke. From then on, your pyruvate is piling up. From then on, your lactate is produced and glycolysis is, is the only source of energy in your cells. And this is, this is what we call Warburg metabolism. Warburg, when you talk about Warburg's work, which was really fundamental and very critical to understand tumor cell metabolism, his observation, and this is what he said, the fate of glucose in tumor cells is lactic acid, even in the presence of, of oxygen. Um, and then when oxidative phosphorylation was discovered, then when the TC Krebs Renyardi cycle was discovered, those were not discovered until like the 40s. I think Hans Krebs, he got his Nobel Prize in 41 or 42. Albert Sanger, he got his Nobel Prize in 1937. And fumarate hydratase, this enzyme which we talk about, talked about. Uh, deficiency is mentioned in Albert Sandiardi's Nobel Prize. So the cat catalysis of fumarate is actually one of the reasons why he got the Nobel Prize. So when, when these mitochondrial nanomotors stop working, then pyruvate will pile up. And the only way of getting rid of pyruvate is practically to release lactate from the cells. Lactate dehydrogen is, is a very low uh, coefficient, metabolic control coefficient enzymes. I'm just using these biochemical terms so you can actually look up these details mm. or your, your audience can uh, try to cover this both from the lame and also from the biochemist perspective. So you guys can kind of dig in further, but practically um, what happens here is nanomotor uh, functions are critical for mitochondrial functions. If those are stop block, then metabolic crowding or metabolic crowding occurs. And uh, uh, the, the product of glycolysis and lactic acid, that's what Warburg uh, observed. And then when we discovered more parts or previous science uh, described more parts of the system, then we can link the Warburg metabolism with, with, various, with various other mitochondrial functions. And it's correct, you, you, you said it right, it's, it's a mitochondrial damage um, and oxidative phosphorylation is, a, is, is the way we produce ATP or biological energy and water in our system, lithium depleted metabolic chromatrix water in the mitochondria. If this system falls apart, then, then cancer is almost in, in, inevitable at some point. It really depends on how much deuterium you're exposed to, what other factors that are playing a role. But it's after all, this is a very fundamental biochemical scenario that we have to kind of help out simply by depleting deuterium and try to repair those failing nanomotors and, and your system, your mitochondria to catch up. But practically that's that's the Warburg metabolism, how critical it is. It's true of other diseases. There are some other biochemical reactions, the single carbon cycles, which are, I don't want to cover here because it's too detailed, but it's, they all accumulate deuterium in your system. So neither Warburg metabolism nor the single carbon serine oxidation, none of neither nor they, they actually accumulate deuterium above the biological threshold. And from then on, cancer definitely is one of the diseases that may develop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. I, 
I, when I was speaking to, um, to Gabor, you were talking about like being in ketosis, this, this, uh, you know, makes you, you, you use, uh, you know, ketones and fat and, and makes metabolic water and low deuterium water or no deuterium water. And, and this helps bring your own deuterium, uh, levels down as opposed to eating carbohydrates, which can raise your, uh, deuterium levels up. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Then, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting and very important point that, um, um, fat or ketone bodies in nature, and it's true of, of, of all living species, they can only produce fatty acids from metabolic matrix water. That's why it's depleted because, uh, de novo fatty acid synthesis take place through an enzyme called fatty acid synthase which is a cytoplasmic enzyme. It's a large enzyme complex, but the substrate for this, melanin coenzyme A, which is the source of all fatty acids on this planet produced in biological systems have to come from citrate or citric acid. And citrate is a mitochondrial DC cycle metabolite. So citrate shuttle, if you uh, call, recall biochemistry uh, lectures back in, college, the citric, citrate shuttle or the citric acid shuttle is practically to take low deuterium citrate out of the mitochondria into the cytoplasma. So actually fatty acid synthase can be used then for new fatty acid synthesis. This is why every fatty acid produced in natural environments, especially in grass fed animals uh, are deuterium depleted because they come from from mitochondrial deuterium depleted water source. They are the first reaction of the TCA cycle. By the way, the carbon dehydrogenase is practically a water consuming process in the mitochondria, and it uses only deuterium depleted water. Could in, in, under optimal conditions. So that's why ketones or fat. Beta, the products of fatty acid beta oxidation or ketone bodies are actually low in deuterium. And when you actually reoxidize, when you oxidize them back into metabolic water and carbon dioxide, they will provide deuterium depleted water. And I like the fact that you said, or oh, no deuterium at all in mitochondria, this is what we believe is that mitochondria should be without deuterium whatsoever. So, uh, Glycolysis um, and other mechanism and water exchange reactions in the TCA cycle, they should deplete deuterium almost, and the, the urea cycle, they should deplete deuterium in mitochondria down to practically zero or negligible. And, uh, <clears throat> but in other body parts, may accumulate. So, again, as Tissues differentiate. If you look at cartilage tissue, collagen, those are different in appearance. They are different in strength and, and, and they are different in, in biological necessity and behavior. So practically when we um, talk about the mitochondria as the fundamental source of health and zero deuterium level, in mitochondria achieved through limiting deuterium intake and letting the body to sort out deuterium and providing citrate that is low in deuterium for your de novo fatty acid synthesis, or you consume a diet, which is a carnivore diet using low deuterium grass-fed animal um, proteins and fat for that matter, because we eat um, fatty meat, meaning that we also eat some proteins with this, but again, the, the, the mixture, the optimal amount of, if we are concerned about food and, and what we drink, well, we usually don't recommend, I don't recommend, or I don't drink, I, I don't make medical recommendations because I don't do clinical work, but um, for my own biochemical kind of state of approach, I, I wait till I'm thirsty and I drink just as much as necess necessary to. I haven't had any water in the last four days, you believe it or not. Oh, look at it's that. It's really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I ate fat though. No, I ate fat. I had a, a big uh, fatty Hungarian sausage last night. Um, and I just cooked some mongolitsa, that's a Hungarian pork fat with 
and I just put it in a jar. And if I'm thirsty, I just, it's <laughs> salty too. I just kind of take a spoonful. I do drink when I'm thirsty. I do some physical work and I wait 10 minutes. If I'm still thirsty, I drink some deuterium depleted water to kill my thirst. But I, I let my body to recycle its own deuterium depleted uh, water. I let my antidiuretic hormone ADH to kick in and and um, reabsorb water in my in my uh, kidney uh, tunnels tubules. And uh, uh, so for that, uh, I think the best way to approach it is to to listen to your body and the signals that come from your body and eat what is naturally low in deuterium and it's 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 in your natural um, physiology and biochemistry, how you can consume, how you can eat, how you can digest and absorb um, animal products. I'm a carnivore, meaning that I, I prefer, I eat very little greens here and there, but mostly I eat meat, especially the hind parts of the animal, so the fat part, the neck, the, the chest, you know, the, all these ribs. Um, kind of meat sources. I don't prefer like, you know, these uh, um, sirloin steaks, high protein content. I, I eat the fat part, fatty part, a lot of bacons and so on. And we get our meat from grass fed animal source. We go to friends who actually hmm. feed their animals and uh, they take every year in a blood sample so the animals don't need to be injected with any kind of material. In Hungary, you can actually grow animals or or, or um, have animals around that are, you know, grass-fed and, and very healthy for that matter. And, and I try to, we try to get the food source from higher altitudes where the team is, is lower in general, as north as possible, where the team is, low so we have our tricks you know, yeah. <laughs> you know it's, once you become a deuteronomicist or once you kind of learn about this isotope then it becomes almost like part of your everyday thinking like how much money you have so <laughs> it's you know it's or is there gas in the car so it's you know it's like it's it's that kind of a, a really interesting you know scenario but it's it's fun i, I have to tell you i really enjoy thinking about it, uh, hopefully understanding it better and talking about this with others because it's just so interesting. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know that you were carnivore. I, f I figured you were probably keto, uh, but I, yeah, I've been doing carnivore for, for a long time and I haven't, I haven't had a, a, a vegetable in half a decade. And, uh, and I don't plan to, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, um, I am keto. Yeah. In the sense that um, I, I measure occasionally my, my ketone levels and mm. the way I like it is usually three millimole per liter or higher. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I am. Sometimes it's, it's, it's even higher or much higher, but I don't mind. Um, I, I uh, like my glucose to be on the low side. Mm. Um, <laughs> three millimole per liter is enough for me, but I have to have ketone money. So I, I do, um, I am in ketosis, uh, but I achieve this through um, eating a mixed diet and doing 30 push-ups and walking the dog eight, 10 kilometers a day. I mean, it's, I do my exercise also to have my body to burn uh, sugar as fast as possible if there's any and there is because our ma our liver um produces glucose from glycerol that is in fat so we don't need glucose we don't need sugar we don't need to eat carbohydrates um whatever is in meat and 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 whatever is in fat um that's enough for us and from then on i'm kind of usually the example that i'm bringing up when it comes i'm 60 years old now and i'm two years heavier than i was in high school so i i think that is very unusual these days um i can yeah. still put on my my uh dress my my suits that i was wearing for, yeah. for my prom so yeah, it's, yeah. it's 
um, <laughs> and, and you're the same. I'm happy to see like how fit you are. So I'm sure you can do the same, but practically this is the payoff about this. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, just on the, uh, on the, I was just thinking about a study I read, uh, years ago, looking at mitochondria and, and being in ketosis. It was, it was looking at that and, and it found that people that were in ketosis that actually increased the number of mitochondria as, as compared to others. And, and they were, they were more effective. So they found that they were around four times as plentiful. So they had four times as many mitochondria and they were four times as, as effective. And I think that, that, um, ties in very, very well with that. You know, if you're having lower deuterium state, lower and being in ketosis, having lower, uh, amounts of deuterium to gum up the works and damage the mitochondria. So it can't, uh, you know, go through oxidative phosphorylation pro properly and damages them to the point that they, they just die off as well. I think that that ties in, uh, perfectly. Yeah. And, and makes a lot of sense from, from the biochemistry point of view, simply because you can only metabolize ketone bodies and ACO uh, molecule or, or SCP parenthome A or free fatty acid chains, you can only metabolize them in mitochondria. There is a carnitine transport system that shoots these fatty acids right into the mitochondria, into the matrix, and that's where you actually break them down to beta oxidation. And this is why you, they don't have to be checked for deuterium, just like glucose has to be checked for deuterium through glycolysis. Glycolysis is a different process. It doesn't need mitochondria. You can still produce lactic acid from pyruvate acid with a very sluggish um, energy production scenario. But actually, if you are in ketosis, if you only have ketone body or mostly the source of energy is ketone bodies, then you have to uh, supply uh, mitochondria. So it triggers mitochondrial proliferation. It actually increases the eff eff efficacy of mitochondrial functions. In our terms, and three, four, well, usually our liver cells have two, three thousand mitochondria under normal conditions. And uh, if you look at obesity, if you if you look at uh, steatosis, if you look at histological slides, then you can see almost like mitochondria are disappearing from these tissues simply because they are not needed. That is stored, and mostly glycolysis is responsible for energy production. And mitochondria dismantle. There is uh, this process called the ubiquination. When you do to deuterate a protein, they get labeled with, with uh, ubiquitin, and then it will be broken down. Meaning that it's more like the junkyard of our of mitochondria become junkyards of our of our uh, damaged uh, mitochondrial nanomotor proteins, and that's not the required metabolic state. Uh, our required metabolic state would be to use mitochondria and the optimal fuel for them is um, ketone bodies. And this is by fasting, religious fasting, this is why sauna, this is why uh, so many lifestyle exercise connected and linked with, you know, with some other activities that have been with humanity for hundreds and thousands and I would say, uh, thousands and thousands of years simply because they'll serve our health through maintaining these mitochondrial functions one way or another. And this is why in old scriptures, you can actually see um, fasting as part of a very important um, uh, religious and health preserving uh, mechanism and, and religious practices to preserve have all major uh, tax, uh, all major tax and, and books contain instructions how to fast and what to eat certain times. This is why we sleep eight hours or seven hours at night to get into ketosis. This is how we are born on this planet. If you measure a baby's beta hydroxybutyrate levels, those are much higher than in the general population. You wake up in the morning after burning up all your glucose and you start breaking down fatty acids, that's when you um, uh, wake up uh, with low deuterium levels and you should maintain that metabolic state. This is why it's restored by every morning after sleep. People don't usually do this. I do because I just have maybe a coffee and then I just move on. And if I get thirsty in the meantime, I just get my little 
spoon thingy with the fat. And if I am hungry, I eat maybe a piece of some bacon or something or and at night or in the evening and usually later after 8, 8.30, I would eat a big fat steak. Nice. With lots of butter on top of it. Yeah, nice. That's how you speak my language there. Like I should, I should show you my fridge sometime. It's, it's, uh, people, people get appalled by it or, or very impressed. It's, it's just like, it's just like a, a you know, a butcher shop, you know, it's just, it's, mm-hmm. there's only meat. There's nothing else in there. And like butter, <laughs> like stack of butter and just, just bodies just stacked up. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm very hungry and I'm not saying I'm very full, but I, I kind of, I'm in a comfortable, this is kind of serves my, but his needs, I don't think I need anything else. I'm not speaking for others, but, you know, to me, this is the comfort zone. I need to know where the animal is from. I need to know what the animal was eating because unfortunately all the farm raised or industry kind of raised meat sources or, or products are unknown source, we don't know that you took those cows or animals were sick. That's why they were, you know, sacrificed at the age of five. One of our friends, um, he actually uh, grazes, his cows are grass fed and the oldest cow he had is, I think it's still alive. It's a, it's a cow, it's not a bull, 34 years old. Oh wow! Had seventeen, had seventeen uh, cow, c- calf. Wow! If you look at the industrial setting, they die at the age of five. They have to sacrifice them, and they maybe have two or three uh, calves. Oh wow! So, so there's a major difference between the health status of grass-fed animals and those are that are raised in farms or under the industrial environment. So. Yeah. I just want to, you know, have a food source. I don't have to eat a lot, but when I eat, I, you know, I, I just eat a, a, a piece of steak like every, everybody else would eat with very little, if, um, with very little greens occasionally. Mm-hmm. It's more like I have to have a taste for it. You know, your body can tell you if you need a, like a piece of tomato or you want a little like homegrown peppers or so, you know, just, it has to be spicy. It has to have the appropriate capsaicin content. You know, it's just, I just want to stay in touch with nature. Practically, I grow my stuff in the backyard. You know, sometimes it gets rotten, but at least I grow my own stuff. I know where it's coming from. And I'm not the best gardener, but it gives me a little bit of exercise. This weekend, I'm going to do, do the tail thing. And I just, I'm just happy to kind of hang around trees and look at those plants and, you know, just, you know, pet the doggy occasionally. And I haven't been to, a, I, have, I haven't bought meat from department stores for four years now. Yeah. I don't even know where the, what kind of, my mom buys sometimes uh, meat from, stores and i can tell the difference immediately mm. and she can do because sometimes um i want her to try even raw meat or i'm not sure if she likes everything that i do and obviously she doesn't have to but at least she can tell the difference between like meat sources and food sources so it's practically generations and knowledge and and science kind of in the home environment but Tastes good. This is what we eat, and I'm happy. I am still like relative. Re- I would say I can still do my push ups and walking and all the physical work and exercise that I'm planning to do. I'm still able to do it. I'm over 60 now, and I'm still happy to develop and learn and study and research more and teach it as well. Nice. Yo, that's great. And um, yeah, I mean, I- you were talking about, you know, getting like, you know, cows from up in, in altitude and up north because, you know, get less deuterium. So I guess like the, the ideal would be like a grass fed, like, you know, Highland cow up in the hills of Scotland or something like that and get those, those shipped down. Is that what, what, what is, well, uh, well, I'll hear your thoughts on that, but, but I was also wanting to know what, 
Um, so you could tell us just a little bit about why that is like, what, what's the difference between deuterium levels in different areas of the world? Yeah, we do. Uh, we do have uh, studies at the Rye University uh, completed some time ago, and we are writing papers about this. If you actually get milk from grass-fed cows, um, the general, I would say, the milk detune content would be in the, we are talking about the whole milk, would be in the 134 ppm range. If you do this from a cow, which is farm raised, it's gonna be 146 ppm. So there is a, and, and, there, and this is also true of, of plants coming from fertilizers, uh, artificial environments or natural environments. There are significant, actually we did write papers about this with Gabor back in like, I think it was 2014, 15, when we were looking at these scenarios. But for example, capsaicin, if it comes from a, a artificial garden or, or glass house fertilizer, GMO kind of experience, then they can have 130 some PPM in their capsaicin content. If it's a, a, a homegrown paprika, that's 95 PPM. So. The capsaicin. So it's it's um, and there's a French team who carried out on research on this, Dr. Dr. Robbins, and uh, there are stunning and there are significant differences in the two content when you look at food. Mm. Now Gabor is publishing a paper where now he lists uh, food sources with the two content. And it's in preview. I I think it's it's under review. But he I I covered this previously based on the data he generated uh, in my talks. And now he's also giving a list of detune uh, food, list of food with detune content. So you can actually pick your, you can actually check what, what your food may have. And you don't look at food as like how taste it is. I look at food as how much detune there is. When I actually oxidize it back to water, what kind of water I'm getting out of it. That's, that's how simple it is. I just, you know, you, it doesn't have to be too complicated. There are very simple scenarios. It's just when you pull into the gas station, depending on like what kind of car you drive, is it, if it's a diesel or if it's a gasoline, then you pick the right pump. You know, you, you don't start pumping like, oh, that's closer or maybe try diesel this time. I mean, we don't do that. And I don't do this with my food either. I'm not eating cookies just because, let's say like that would be better today. It's not good ever. It's really not your food. It's just practically you just um, have to decide or have to know what to put in your body and how to keep mm -hmm. your body in idling situations. You know, a little fasting here and there, um, fasting during the day um, is, is a good idea. I think it, unless I'm very hungry or I was doing some physical exercise, then I will eat something in, in between, but I usually eat at night, uh, bigger meals. And um, I do fasting occasionally, depending on what kind of religious times we are in. And sometimes I don't eat two or three days, uh, depending on how I feel about my detune content or what I've been eating uh, before or what, because when you travel, for example, when you, when you don't know exactly what they put on the table, then, you know, you don't want to kind of be unpolite. So you take a few bites, but then you kind of have to correct for those measures simply because you don't know the source. So you may fast a few days and it feels better. And this is how I do my sleep patterns. I go to sleep around 11-ish and I wake up at 7, you know, 6.37, meaning that it's a very um, kind of standard pattern. I do a ketone body measurement occasionally. And uh, I like that to be on the higher range. And then I just kind of just go after my feelings and my my. Uh, nanomotors kind of feel of how we operate. I check how fast my uh, nails are growing. And I also 
let the mosquito land on my skin because usually they don't see me, meaning that they don't, they, they want to be here. So I, it's funny just to see the, the mosquito on your skin and it's just kind of wandering around um, and it would never bite you because they don't see you. It's like they think like they landed on a tree trunk or something. And sometimes I do this with ticks because the doggy, my dog gets ticks and I just let him, I just, I just wonder how, like how they behave. And they just wander around like they don't see my blood simply because it's too low in deuterium. For them, it's not food. So, so and I, I check my nails, how fast they grow, my hair. I mean, there's a lot of high sleep, high, you know, there's, you, you can learn this by experience. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's really an interesting new type of, I taste water, how much deuterium, now I can tell by taste. It cannot be carbonated, but uh, you can learn again how to chemically, how to sense deuterium. And in fact, uh, there are scientific studies out there showing that the water, the deuterium content of your water would have different action potential in your, um, in your uh, taste uh, buds, in your, in your oral cavity, so in your mouth. So we, we do sense butyl in water. We just forgot how it tastes. It's a little bit sweeter. And I just really learned it how it tastes. We went to China with one of my other colleagues and we asked the Chinese to do deplete a water making company that behind us, that we don't know exactly what they mix, mix their 25 ppm water with various amounts of tap water. It cannot be heated, cannot be carbonated, cannot be um, um, uh, flavored. And we just told them, just give us a glass and we'll tell you like what the tune content they might have. And we were right 100%. Nice. nice. That's so you can idea. learn this. Yeah. I think this is going to be one of yeah. the main areas yeah. or main topics in the Vry University Deuteronomics course is we have very prominent uh, uh, presenters and lecturers in that course. For example, Judith Klinman, she is, she was the uh, Dean of Berkeley of uh, Science. Uh, she studied deuterium and proton tunneling effects in biochemical and chemical reactions. I'm not gonna go in details because that's part of the lectures. We have uh, Stephanie Senna from the MIT. She's very interested in de deuteronomics and deuterium research and uh, various other lecturers from Canada, United States, from Europe, from South Africa, who actually uh, deliver very interesting talks after like decades of deuterium proton tunnel research. And this is where it comes together in this in these medical applications, or how you can taste and how you can learn how to detect deuterium in your body without very complicated or complex measures. And it's it's fun to watch a mosquito as it can see your blood. It's just I'm just laughing at it, you know. And I can sit a hot summer night when the mosquitoes are coming. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um and you were mentioning too that like when you get when you maybe get a little bit thirsty you end up exercising and that's uh it's me because you, you know you're, you're running through more uh ketones through your your mitochondria and you're actually making more molecular water is that right like how, how much molecular water can we actually make um just at rest or then and then with exercise like how does that how, how much do we get yeah so so one kilogram of fat produces 1.1 kilograms of water. Hmm. Meaning okay. that if you, uh, carbohydrates produce only half of that. Mm -hmm. So practically when you look at fat, you need to look at, look at it like water. Actually, this is how it looks if you heat it up. But it's a different chemical bond because in fat, hydrogens are carried by carbons in water, hydrogen is carried by oxygen. It's only the host atom, the host hydrogen is different, but the role of hydrogen is the same if it's in water or if it's in, in, uh, in fat. Uh, if the 
hydrogen is in water, then photosynthesis will break that and oxygen is released and the protons are attached to carbon dioxide. This is how fat is produced to make organic molecules. When, it's, when hydrogen is attached to carbons, then you eat them and your mitochondria will oxidize them back into water and, and this carbon dioxide is released. So it's practically a, a kind of a, a circular process of a ping pong game with protons and it's just practically depend on, on what side of the table is that ping pong ball. Is it on water or is it on carbons? But you always harvest uh, protons for your biological and for your energy producing purposes. Now, if the tune gets into the system, that changes the game because it's a heavy ball. It doesn't bounce us back from the table. It's like trying to play ping pong with a medicine ball. It's not gonna happen or like a soccer ball. It's, they have a different kind of field, a different dynamic. It's, the ball is all determines what kind of ball game you can play. It's not the, how many players, it's not how big the stadium. If you are in a, and you played rugby, is that right? You were a professional rugby player. Yeah. If, if they throw a soccer ball into the rugby field, you wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And, <laughs> And this is what mitochondria does with DT. I'm like, what is this? What can I do with this practically? Because mitochondria are designed for proton harvesting and, and, and proton-based energy production systems. And the amount of protons they process, it's about seven cubic meter of water a day or equivalent protons. It's like a, a small swimming that we wrote, that we transfer each day. So it's it's a um, uh, one time, um, actually, I went to the, we went to the Danube River and we looked at how much water you produce through, during your lifetime. And we were standing at the Danube River, which is the second largest river in Europe. And uh, you have to stand there for almost two minutes to see the amount of water that flows down as a human being would produce um, um, in a lifetime and uh, you have to stand there it's it's I think it's about um, it was at that time it was 3500 liters the discharge of, of the Danube River that day was 3500 liters per second so it's a large amount of water definitely a large amount of protons and I think our estimation like the way we estimated we could be more kind of on the high side, it's more of a conservative kind of estimation, but the proton transfer is very significant. Transferring protons is what makes you alive. That's what life is, transferring protons and attaching them to oxygen or carbons and playing ping pong with these protons. That's what life is. And deuterium has a certain role in the system, but it has to be limited. It has to be filtered. It has to be discriminated. It has to be used for the right purpose in the right tissues and the right organs and the right proteins. And then you are able to, to build a structure of a fit yet flexible and energy producing system, just like a human body. I'm not saying this, we are machines. I'm saying we are uh, uh, creatures created for that purpose to produce this water. And I think this is what we can follow as the basic principle behind life. Uh, throughout scriptures, throughout letters, throughout ancient writings, and through science as we discover more and more facts about our bodies. Nice. And then um, you also mentioned saunas. So going to a sauna, that, that can help you deplete uh, deuterium as well. Is that right? Yeah. So by sweating, you deplete deuterium by exhaling um, your metabolic water or sweating. Mm -hmm. And that means you get rid of water and liquids and fluid and salts and fasting or, or, or um, a, a diet that is high in, in, in fat and low in carbohydrates, those will not give you this feeling of kind of like, you know, I, I ate so much, I can't think of eating any, any, any more. That's practically not what, like fatty food would do because it, it produces water so quickly, so fast that you you are you are reaching a a 
comfort zone very quickly because your body can sense that you're, you are producing efficiently due to the of water and this is the required state and you have enough ketone bodies as fuels and substrates to produce that water. You don't need carbons. Those are gone in the form of carbon dioxide. You breathe them out. You don't need water unless you cannot produce enough water, meaning that you don't have enough ketone bodies. You don't have enough proton source. So that's that's what comfort or the comfort minimum is for that. But our, our systems, our body is designed to, to actually to short food shortages. They, our biochemical systems, our energy producing systems cannot really handle too high of um, like um, energy sources, meaning that if you would get the amount of energy that is in a hamburger, in, in an IV, for, you know how, as you work in, in, in the ICU, you know how careful they drop those uh, artificial transparent or nutrition when it takes place, you know how delicate they have to kind of provide energy into the system because when absorption is not controlling the amount of energy that comes in in the form of substrates, then they can kill you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and I, I heard a very interesting talks from uh, Dr. Diamond at UCLA who described the situation that um, they actually have um, our body, our biochemical systems have the lowest biological threshold, meaning that your bones can hand, then your bones can kind of uh, carry three, four times of your body weight. You have to jump, you have to run. But in metabolism, if you overload the energy intake or the amount that you need, if you overload just by 1% over a longer period of time, you're gonna be obese. Because your energy, your mitochondria, your oxygen supplies are designed for optimum energy intake and everything else will, ca will cause uh, crowding, metabolite or metabolic crowding. And it will have over time, I'm not talking about overnight, I'm talking about over time, but you have to, you, you have to be very careful of how much you eat and what you eat because simply your system cannot handle over. It's practically, the way I usually tell my students to, to have a, to, to, to eating uh, like um, an, a, a large big ice cream with all those added sugars and all those added fructose and all these sweet stuff, it's practically jumping into a swimming pool without knowing how to swim. Because your body doesn't know what to do with all the sugar all of a sudden. And, uh, and truthfully, if you overload, metabolism is not a biological system that can be overloaded over, over periods of time. Your bones, your um, muscles, yes, they are designed for you know, extreme challenges, but your metabolism, usually in nature, food is in shortage. It's not necessarily, um, little in amount is practically the desire or the, the metabolic regulatory regular processes would not allow you to over it. And this is, and even when you eat, it takes hours and hours and hours to kind of tweet out, to separate all the ingredients and absorb what you need. Your microbiome will break down most of it. Uh, plant eating um, herbivores, they have to re regurgitate and digest it again and, and, and again. And so it's a whole day process practically after consuming a certain amount of food. So I just kind of do it once a day. I let my body to run its course and I don't want to overload the system simply because it's very dangerous after all. Yeah. It's interesting too. That's, that's pretty uh, impressive. That you haven't, you haven't drank water in four days. Um, I've, uh, I've sort of tried those water fasts a couple of times and I was just, and I, I got like a day and a half into it. I was, uh, and, and I was just like, Nope, I want water. I'm, I'm like used to drinking a lot of water just, just from, you know, my previous life in athletics, I would always drink just a ton of water. And, um, I'm always, I was interested in that as well. Giving that so a did you, uh, did you eat fat when you got thirsty? Did you try a spoonful of yeah. fat? Or no, I haven't tried that yet but I, I, I will, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm interested okay. to try so it. So what I do is just, I, I, I just get a spoonful of fat. I just get it onto my bucket, you know, in my, mm. I, I don't eat it at once. I just let it melt mm. and I just let it drip in my mouth and, and I just drink it as it comes. Okay. It tastes like water practically. Yeah, yeah. And, it uh, is practically water and the amount, if you look at like a, a gram of fat will produce you 1.1 point gram of water, meaning that, <clears throat> again, if you're thirsty and if it's not hand, then you drink a, a glass of water. I'm not saying don't drink water. If you're thirsty, if you've been exercising, if you need water and your anti-diuretic ADA system cannot preserve more water, then you have to drink water. Yes, indeed. Mm. Uh, no question about it. If I was running maybe like a half marathon, I would be drinking a lot of water too, simply because I sweat it out. And I would be thirsty that no fat would take care of it. So in that scenario, but you can actually start kind of playing with it a little bit. And after all, you can actually maybe just measure an ADH level. It's usually less than 0.5 in most of the cases that I heard of. It should be a lot higher than that. So there's, there's ways to go. Yeah, you can check these out. And then... Um... And I remember you, I saw a talk that you uh, gave and you mentioned something about um, deuterium affecting, I think it was a, a study from Oxford talking about deuterium affecting serotonin levels and, and potentially being implicated in depression as well. Is that right? Yeah. So <clears throat> we believe that in the central nerves in neuroscience, mm -hmm. uh, because um um, neuroscience, they have to consume at least 25% glucose simply because of its anabolic or anaplerotic role. There's a lot of neurotransmitters that are produced from TCA cycle metabolites. So that, that, because in ketone bodies, acetylcoenzyme A, which is a two carbon molecule, which comes from fatty acids, they are lost in the first round because of the two carbon dioxide releasing reactions in glucose or from glucose, you can actually generate oxaloacetate that can replenish the cycle. So brain cells do need um, uh, glucose. And for that matter, they are exposed to deuterium at higher level as, as compared to other tissues. Now, the way neurocytes kind of protect their DNA from becoming cancerous or becoming tumor cells is, is they lose the ability to transcribe DNA. So they, they cannot divide, even though they have mosaicism, they have a lot more DNA in the cells than, they, than a normal cell would. They cannot divide because they, they lost the ability. They cannot copy a template. And red blood cells do it differently. They don't have mitochondria, so they lose their DNA. They lose their template. So our body already figured out how to live with deuterium, yet you either lose the ability to copy DNA or you lose the template itself, which is uh, red blood cells. And um, when you talk about these scenarios in brain cells especially, and this is what uh, relates to that paper, if you look at the the human amount of drinking water, and in that paper, there's a map of the United States with the tomb content in drinking water and, all, and, and also the, the morbidity related to or disease frequencies in you know psychological, psychological diseases like anxiety, depression, and so on. So you can actually see the correlation between those neurological psychiatric diseases and the tomb content in drinking water which is also very interesting because that's how they match up with cancer, for example. This is how they match up with obesity, for example. And uh, personally, I don't think serotonin has such a, a, a major role because in the meantime, serotonin is, was now discredited as the major driver behind uh, um, um, anxiety or, or depression for that matter, because usually they come in bipolar scenarios. Usually depressed people, sometimes they swing into the, um, to, to the opposite pole of the spectrum. But practically 
that is what they believed could be the, the role of deuterium in the central nerve system to regulate serotonin uh, levels. But I think after all, this is just practically a high deuterium mitochondrial function related issue and uh, certain brain areas affected that you develop depression. I don't think, well, serotonin changes in the return, but I, I don't think that's the single or the mm. only cause of it or causation on, in this process. There's many other uh, details that could be kind of uh, clarified through research and science, but I, I, I do believe that it's a very good paper, very interesting and very important it's from the Oxford University. And uh, I did cite it in my talks, but, but, but practically deuterium damages your body based on the organ specific or organ system that it, that it accumulates in. And that's why in the liver, if fatty liver obesity develops, that's, that's a different phenotype or different appearance of deuterium damage. There are um, neurological problems, depression, anxiety, and so on. There are obviously circulatory problems. Um, there are, uh, and that, that could be uh, part of your uh, pump functions in heart muscle, pump functions in muscles in general. So you get chronic fatigue, your exercise pattern is not as good. So you, you lose a lot of energy for that sense in metabolic water that affects your systems, your organ systems differently based on where this disease process or deuterium accumulation is emphasized. If you consume deuterium in the form of carbohydrates and sugars, yes, depression maybe because sugars are used by brain cells because glucose is one of the few molecules that passes the broad brain barrier. It's not true of triglycerides and so on. Uh, so your brain cells cannot be in ketosis. That's why neurocytes lost their ability to divide. That's why they lose the transcriptase or the, the polymerases that produce DNA. So there's no, um, the, there's no DNA replication in neuroscience. All tumors that grow in, in, the, in the skull or, or in your brain, those are usually um, connective tissue related or, 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 or cells that are not, they are actually not neuroscience. So, um, Obviously, in, 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 in young age, in childhood, you may develop uh, primary tumors that start from neuroscience, but the, like, or muscle cells. Muscle cells cannot divide either because mm. they use a lot of glucose. So their DNA is dispersed onto the sarcomeres and they are just deposited around the. We learned this in histology. It was uh, when I was looking at those slides, and I said, Man, this makes no sense. Why? a neuroscience is not able to divide. It would be great when you have a neurological condition when you need new, new uh, neuro, neuroscience. And same with muscle cells. Why muscles cannot divide muscle cells? Simply because it's very dangerous for them because they use substrates that are loaded with deuterium. Red blood cells, why don't they have nuclei? They could divide in peripheral blood. No, you can't because they don't have mitochondria. So they actually process deuterium high sugars to make them lactic acid. And lactate is sent either to the liver to restore, to be restored as glucose in the Koi cycle. Or more interestingly, if you are a long distance runner, then you're going to develop a gut bacteria that produces propionic acid from lactic acid. So actually, pre produce a ketone body a deuterium depleted ketone body to run the marathon because otherwise you will not be able to run. You have to train for it, but it's not only, you don't need muscles for it. You need strength and you need the ability to run long distance. You need those nanomoles in your muscles to function. It's not necessarily muscle strength. So you adopt to this by developing a gut bacteria uh, which produces propionic acid, which is a ketone body to be oxidized with your muscle cells and load it and keep their deuterium low so they can actually function for several hours as you run these long distances. So, it, and then when deuteronomics came into place, then all 
found in, in place, meaning that I now can explain and I understand why these organs, uh, neurocytes, sarcomeres or, or, or muscle cells and uh, red blood cells cannot divide under any circumstances. It's because they are exposed to the wrong subshade uh, when it comes to maintaining DNA integrity, and that's glucose. While other cells, uh, which have mitochondria and they have the choice of picking either glucose or ketone bodies, they would stick with ketone bodies uh, if we are in ketosis and we are just fine. We don't need sugar for that. The amount of glucose that is necessary for your brain function, your liver can produce those through gluconeogenesis and, and hepatic glucose production. So you don't have to eat glucose, but if you do, then it's, it's a risk for those organs for deuterium, to, to acquire deuterium, and for that, they, for that matter, they protect themselves by getting rid of their DNA templates or their ability to, uh, to uh, use these polymerases. They lost the enzyme, enzyme itself, or they practically just cut up the nuclei and put them in little storage vesicles around the um, cell membrane, so they cannot be uh, transcribe that. They cannot be um, polymeric. They, it cannot be multiplied, but it can still be transcribed simply because it has to have protein synthesis. So <clears throat> in red blood cells, even that is not true, but red blood cells are exposed to the most deuterium because they are actually circulating blood. And if we ate a good GMO apple or fruit, whatever, there's a lot of deuterium loaded um, sugar in your in your and or your soda pop or some kind mm. of soft drink or you know who knows what's out there um i don't really know these things anymore but practically it's a, it's a dangerous just to walk around and sip and drink all this stuff and your body somehow knew this like millions and millions of years ago simply you have to have tissues that have no ability to divide and obviously it comes kind of uh, shorthanded when it comes to like neurodegeneration. Um, it comes, um, you know, somewhat disadvantages when somebody has muscle wasting because you cannot really by proliferating those or, um, uh, you know, trying to repair those tissues. It's only scar, it's gonna be only scar tissue because those cells cannot divide with the same phenotype or function. So practically it's a give or take one way or another, but it's all about deuterium. It's, it's all about deuteronomics. And I've been practicing this with colleagues for a long time. And I have to tell you, deuteronomics is probably the only science field that never let me down. Meaning that it could always add to the knowledge and have you know, colleagues, clinicians like yourself. And, and we just um, have to fit this in our everyday thinking, I would say, there's no hour in my life, daytime, that I wouldn't think of the two one way or another. Either how much there is in food, how much I exercise, how much I walk, how much push up I did, push ups I did, how easy it was. You know, you, you test yourself, you practice how fast my nails are growing, did that mosquito bite me, did that thick work. Well, it's just practically just kind of this be in concert with nature one way or another, just watch your body, how it interacts with your environment and you can almost measure your detune level without any fancy instrument. I'm not saying like precisely, but you can tell me in your food, where you get it, how much detune you're consuming it. And uh, yes, indeed, that's very, very critical, like how much detune you take in, how much detune you consume and how much that detune is still in the capacity of being sorted out by your regular physiological, uh, biochemical regulatory processes and to preserve health that way. That's why we go up and get water buffalo stuff <laughs> in the mountains. You know, those are just, I mean, beautiful animals. They are very nice and kind for that matter. And they just give us the best source of metabolic water for that matter. And that's how they live. Nice. And we just look at each other and we just like, okay, that's where you are. 
it's it's fun i'll tell you nice. and so i mean i guess that, that's that's one of the main things is, is avoiding things that that uh will ramp up your deuterium so so sugar glucose fruits you mentioned especially you know the the you know um, large production ones um what are other things like you know, um, you know seed oils are bad you know are becoming more prominent and how toxic they are do they have do they play a role in this at all well i do think and that's just you know between you and i obviously it's going to be heard by everybody else but practically um i i think the biggest kind of misleading trend in humanity is this vegetarian diet. Mm. Be honest with you. And, and I'm, I'm very honest. I'm very frank. Mm -hmm. um, we are not plenty. We are, we, we can eat potentially everything like based on our, mm -hmm. like our characterization, but that's not, we cannot maintain our body and body functions based on plant-based diet. That's, there's a, a movie I think the Capriccio is in that movie. He get lost in Alaska or something. Um, I don't remember the title exactly, but he, he dies. He, he cannot, he has no guns. He cannot hunt animals. They run and he dies in what? In two, two, he has all the, uh, all the vegetarian diet components, seeds, plants, you know, leaves, uh, you know, fruits whatsoever. But it's it's still a, it's not still not enough for survival, and um, that's I after all we have to balance the two, and the balancing is now, if you hear me out, is practically much more on the meat and the fat side, and very little uh, like greens or, or or fruits for that matter. Occasionally, I eat like a seasonal fruit if I have it, just to try, just to, just like what animals would eat when the time is their season, we, that's how treat propagates themselves. That's how treats, uh, that's how plants propagate themselves because they can't move, they cannot throw the seeds away. They have to wrap them in this very kind of attractive and tasty kind of sweet apple and then the wild boar or the deer will eat it and walk away two, three kilometers, have diarrhea. And that's that's exactly how plants eat, but that's the, the, the role of fruits in nature. So as long as it's seasoned, as long as it's local, as long as you found it, as long as it was fallen from the tree, it's, it's funny because where I walk my dog, um, somebody put peeled apples on the, like, out there for the wild boars, there's a, a track, a wild boar track. So that person put um, an, uh, apple peels that got probably from the department store, and no animal would touch it. <laughs> now the wild, the wild apple tree is all gone. They they eat them up all. Yeah. The wild apple and the pear tree. There's no apple. There's no pear. If you actually buy an apple in the department store and you peel it and you put it out, they will not touch it. So this person, yesterday I just saw this. This person yesterday actually, because the peels were not eaten, now this person uh, cut up an apple into four pieces. So it's not only the peels, but now the whole apple is there. And I guarantee you, I'll send you a picture of this as we are done with this conversation. And I guarantee you, today when we walk, when I walk the dog and just want to see what's out there, I guarantee you those apples will be there. <laughs> just don't want them away. Because they, they yeah. can smell the, that something is iffy. Yeah. Or it's really not from that, it's not natural. Yeah. What's the thing that was, uh, I forget who said it, but. Um... There's a, there's a quote that said, uh, humans are the only animals intelligent enough to make our own food and the only ones dumb enough to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. If you yeah. kind of keep your eyes open and you walk in nature and with curiosity and you want to see what other humans do and what the animals do, 
I mean, be honest with you, it's really scary to walk up to a water buffalo. Why? Because they can turn over a 40 ton tractor tray. If you are pissed or they are not happy, you better run. Well, even that wouldn't help because they run much faster than you. Yeah. And just to walk up to these animals and, and kind of, you know, just kind of let them know that you're part of the same system one way or another and you're not enemies you are you're kind of live you know in a certain context with each other and 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 actually they are very calm very bright very beautiful animals and they have a certain behavior so you can actually catch them and you can actually eat them i mean they really learned how to live with with, with humans and they actually are very happy in some of those confinements that are still part of nature. Simply they cannot really wander all over, but they have big enough land to roam. And when time comes, we provide them food and protection one way or another. And at some point we'll eat it. But you know, this is how it's been as long as we lived on this planet and this is how it's been designed. And there's not that many species that you can use for these purposes, but there are, seem to be animals that are actually serving this purpose to be a good depleted fatty meat source. And they live around. Yeah. Especially if you come to Hungary, there's water buffaloes, there's gray cows, there's mongolitsa pork, there pigs. There's, there's a lot of animals that like to hang around, you know, habitats and kind of um, live in the same household in that matter simply because you're able to develop this kind of relationship with them. And it's it's to me it's a big deal. Nice. Yeah well like that I'm certainly on the same page with you there. I mean I've I've I sort of stopped eating plants and just started eating meat 22 years ago when I was taking cancer biology um, in my undergrad. And just learn about just plant toxins in general and just the defense chemicals that they use to protect themselves. And, and so my cancer biology professor at the time basically said that he didn't eat any plants at all. Didn't eat any vegetables, you know, and his, in his words, he said, you know, plants are trying to kill you. Like you shouldn't be eating these things. And so that's why I, I sort of steered away from it at the time. And it's, you know, it's, it's nice to see, you know, I, I mean, I, I hate, I don't want to be like a victim of confirmation bias, you know, and, and just see the things that, that line up with what I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, but it is nice to see, it is nice to see these other things, just everything sort of coming together and fitting uh, and coming full circle. And, you know, when I look at medicine from that perspective, that the kind of animal we are is one that's supposed to be eating meat and predominantly meat, if not exclusively meat. And by going outside of that, we're, we're having these sorts of health ramifications, and that, that are, are entirely preventable and even reversible. And so it's nice to find out other, other mechanisms like the deuterium that fit so well into that and make so much sense to me. Uh, it's just really nice. And it's been an absolute uh, pleasure learning that from you today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, this is my own experience through science and teaching and living this lifestyle, meaning that um, I prefer the food source that I know exactly what the detune level is. Not exactly, but I know in like what range it could. And plants have no other escape or protections. They can't run away. Mm -hmm. They have to protect themselves through a whole lot of toxins and chemicals, except for a few, but they grow certain roots and they repropagate themselves with the appropriate sunlight, that's grass. Mm -hmm. And um, for that, and there are certain animals that are designed to eat that we are not. And for that matter, it's just, to me, it's easy to comprehend. It's not that complicated. It's really, well, some of the biochemistry and metabolic control analysis patterns could be complicated, but that's our job to kind of use those to make, you know, scientific arguments clear and easy to follow and discuss this with our colleagues and, you know, get these things uh, kind of 
you know, clarified and, and straightened out and uh, have doctors at the bedside to understand the diseases better and to be able to diagnose and, and treat those diseases or let people just kind of understand their own conditions and take care of themselves simply by knowing some very basic fundamental things about their bodies and eat accordingly. So I, I, I just admire your work as a clinician and as a scientist, as a teacher, I would like to contribute by giving you more details of like how this works in our system as the physiological and biochemical background that we are coming. Well, I, I really appreciate it. And it's been absolute uh, pleasure and, and, and just a great learning experience for me. And I'm sure everyone watching this will, uh, will think so as well. So, um, uh, professor, how, how do people get in touch with you or how to follow you? Do you have, um, like a website or, or anything like that, that people can, can take a look at? I do have a laslogboros.com website where there are additional, um, information, uh, you can subscribe to the Rye University course uh, through the winter course. It's in the submolecular medical sciences. If you go to the Vrai University website, uh, my email is uh, like my first, my family name, boros.laslo at yahoo.com. And uh, there are many talks and many papers in the medical literature and on YouTube that you can, or your audience, they can explore more. If you have questions, you can reach me through your um, uh, website as well. I believe so after this talk is posted. So, um, and I'm very happy to, to discuss these uh, with uh, people who are interested in learning. I'm not a clinician, so I can't, and I won't give medical advice. This is a whole different arena, but I would like to give them knowledge, solid and easy to understand enough to make decisions. And that's practically just as easy as pulling into the gas station and looking at your menu, or it's just a visa, or it's just a gasoline. So that's how we fill up our heads. We are actually low detail, water producing, meat eaters, carnivores. So just deal with it. <laughs> nice. That's perfect. Well, great. Well, well, Dr. Boros, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.